Happy Monday, everyone, and welcome into the Go 24-7 podcast. My name is Bryce Kuhn alongside Dylan Sanders and Glenn West. Uh, guys, we're going to talk basketball today. Yes, baseball had a nice little series win. Disappointing Sunday over in College Station. They got a big series coming in. Uh, football is back from spring break. They're going to be you know, restarting all the spring football activities here very soon. But we're going to talk some basketball, and we're going to start off with the good news. So if you like good news, make sure to subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, and follow us on anywhere you get your podcasts. Dylan Sanders, in all of his green hoodie lore, was near, almost courtside. Uh, Dylan had the premium seats uh, for LSU's weekend at the PMAC, and Dylan, it was a great environment. Uh, LSU advances to the Sweet 16. You were in attendance. Uh, kind of walk us through what was the atmosphere like. It looked really good from TV. Uh, walk us through, and then just the performance. Just obviously Angel Reese, but this team just now they're heading to the Sweet 16, and you were kind of having a literal front row seat to the first two games of the tournament. Yeah, I mean, being able to sit courtside is is is, is awesome. Uh, it's something I've never done before a basketball game. Well, except for last year. Um they did had the same setup, but essentially being able to sit courtside is just really, really cool for a playoff game. Um, but other than that, like the game itself, uh, neither of the games were fairly close. We pretty much everyone expected Michigan to either put up a good fight or have it be uh, or or win the game outright. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people were like, "Okay, well, this is where LSU's," you know. Their fun story ends, you know, the the two lost team that everybody thinks sucks for some reason. Uh, and that wasn't the case. LSU uh, went out and dominated a Big Ten team, uh, something that a lot of people didn't think would happen. Everyone discounted the SEC this year. Shout out to Ole Miss beating Stanford. Like, mm -hmm. uh, LSU, uh, the SEC is putting, out, putting on in the tournament, and uh, LSU looked dominant uh, and kind of in a surprising turn of of fashion as to where how they started the year scoring 100 points in like 10 straight games or whatever it was uh they are smothering on defense right now um and it, it's kind of been a trend in, in the in the tournament but especially last night they were just faster uh they were stronger um kind of all of the typical sec uh, misnomers that people people put out they're bigger faster stronger they weren't bigger than michigan but they were faster and stronger um, and it, uh, it, it showed and it allowed them to just utterly dominate. And I think we can't go much longer without mentioning the name Angel Reese. Mm. Wow. <laughs> what a performance. Yeah. Uh, first ever player in NCAA tournament history to score 25 points and 24 rebounds. Um, incredible. It was just one of the best performances I've ever seen. She had six, six blocks, blocks. Yeah. six blocks, three steals, three assists, only one turnover, one foul, like two fouls, maybe insane. They, yeah. uh, it was what uh, underrated part of the. The Michigan front court just so mad the entire night. Like they were, they were angry. They were yelling. They were complaining the entire night, and it was because they got out rebounded by 20, 20 rebounds. Angel Reese almost had as many rebounds as the entire team did, and for a lot of the night, she had more. It's just insane. It was, it was just an insane performance, and uh, her and Ladeja Williams both really, really stood out in the in the front court, and looked like one of the best front courts in the country, if not the best. Yeah, Glenn, you were watching uh, on TV, and look, we kind of go back. If you didn't tune in for some reason, LSU hosted Hawaii, the 14 seed, on Friday, knocked them off, and then played Michigan. And what you know, Dylan alluded to, a lot of people thought, hey, you know, LSU stumbled in the SEC tournament. Would Michigan cause them to stumble? Uh, Glenn, how impressed with with you with this team, the makeup, and obviously the atmosphere, which was a really good one inside the PMAC on Sunday evening. Yeah, very impressed. I think they were able to squeeze in 8,000 people um, last night. I think that was around the announced attendance, something where in that range. Um, it felt it felt louder than 8,000, yeah. that's for <laughs> yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and you could really see that, um, you know, look, I mean, 
Dylan kind of hit the nail on the head there. This was the Angel Reese show. Um, she had almost a double double, like two minutes into the uh, second quarter. I mean, she was just kind of, you know, throwing the ball around the rim a lot and, and getting her own rebounds and finishing around the rim. So, uh, yeah, just a really uh, spectacular performance. But I think really when the tide really changed for LSU last night was when Jasmine Carson came in and hit three threes. Hmm. Um, I think it was, you know, five or six point game at that point. She comes in, hits those threes, and it's off to the races from there. Um, I thought that was a really – uh, important stretch for LSU last night. Um, and, you know, just listening to a little bit of what Mulkey had to say after the game, um, you know, her having, you know, you know Carson coming in to, to hit those threes was really big um, because it, you know, LSU really struggled from the three point line against Hawaii, um, you know, kind of turns, uh, you know, kind of got people, I think, in, you know, a better frame of mind. And, and LSU uh, had a really nice night from beyond the arc. And it's going to be, uh, really, really important. Um, I think kind of moving forward here in the tournament, um, you've got to, you know, the three point line is, is the ex ultimate X factor and, and at, at any level of basketball. Um, and you know, if you're able to hit six, seven, eight threes in a game, uh, it really puts a lot of pressure on your opponent. Um, so it's, it's, it was a really impressive performance. You know, I was kind of in the camp that I thought it would be a really, uh, kind of back and forth game. We heard so much about Michigan size coming into the game, and LSU just completely dominated them on the glass, and it really wasn't close from the start. And you could tell that they really struggled um, to get that that trio going. They had a trio, I think, that scored uh, double figures uh, in their you know first round win, and LSU shut them down. I mean, they uh, it was a really just all around great performance. Uh, it's the first time that they're. Back to the Sweet 16 since 2014. Uh, certainly, I think uh, you can expect many more trips under Kim Mulkey. Um, and, and it's progress from last year. You know, they didn't get out of the first round last year or uh, the, the first couple of games last year. They won their first game but lost their second one. Um, so to get, you know, leave the PMAC with two wins uh, to close out this uh, pretty historic season and get uh, to the second weekend was really impressive to see. Yeah, and guys, they're going to be heading, obviously, the Greenville 2 Regional. I don't know how many fans caught that. The Greenville 1, the Greenville 2, uh, South Carolina, the number one seed over on the other Greenville Regional. Indiana, the number one seed in the Greenville 2. So kind of looking at the matchup, we don't have a specific time, as, as far as my knowledge, on Friday night, Friday afternoon, we, we know it will be. Uh, they're going to be playing the number two seeded Utah Utes. That's going to be a really fun matchup to kind of watch and really gauge where, obviously, during the regular season, everyone circled uh, the, the calendar, the date, when they're playing South Carolina. Well, this is a kind of a chance to see, hey, how do you match up against some of the other you know, elite teams, great teams across the country not named South Carolina? So they'll be taking on Utah. Uh, but also kind of looking around that bracket. We talked about the SEC, and I thought this was really something that we should kind of mention as well. Uh, Mississippi State, you know, a 15-point win over Creighton in the first round. They advanced to the round of 32. They end up falling by five to Notre Dame, who's a solid team. Obviously, South Carolina reaches the Sweet 16. Not a big surprise there. Uh, when you go down, Dylan, you mentioned Ole Miss, uh, the number eight-seeded Ole Miss, beats Gonzaga handedly in the first round and then knocks off Stanford in what was a really fun matchup to kind of watch uh, as that as well. Tennessee, obviously there as well. They'll be playing actually tonight for a chance to go to the Sweet 16 against Toledo. And then going down, Georgia knocked off Florida State. They ended up losing to Iowa and Mississippi State, obviously with that playing game we talked about earlier. So, you know, you look across the SEC, pretty well represented. Obviously you have Ole Miss, South Carolina, now LSU in the Sweet 16, Tennessee playing for an opportunity tonight. Uh, guys, I, I think it kind of just speaks to the value of L SEC women's basketball right now, the, the coaches that are in the SEC. And, uh, you know, as we saw throughout the entire regular season, kind of going more into the matchup on Friday, look, the game against Utah – uh, we're going to be hearing a lot about the Utes over the next three, four, five days. Uh, any early indications? I mean, how, how far? I think we visited this maybe about a month and a half ago. I'll let you revisit it before we kind of move on to the uh, the other side of the basketball programs. Glenn, I'll give it to you first. From here, where, where do you think the women can go? Uh, they get to the Greenville 2 opportunity, which is just – that just cracks me up, Greenville 2. But they get there. How far do you think this team can go now that they are in the Sweet 16? 
Yeah, well, I think you could honestly make the case that LSU wasn't playing its best basketball heading into this tournament. And, you know, through two games at least, I think that they have really stepped it up in all in all facets, um, you know, especially on defense. They've looked really, really good. And, you know, look, defense is going to – defense can take you really far in, in a tournament like this. And, um, you know, it's really about which team catches fire, uh, which one's – uh, handle the adversity, and I think LSU's in a really good spot. You know, uh, U- Utah's a really good team, um, you know, but but LSU is too, and I think there's uh, a lot of confidence right now going on with LSU. I think they addressed a lot of the problems that kind of crept up on them in that Tennessee loss a, a couple weeks ago, and um, really um, just – very, very impressed by what they were able to accomplish um, in, in Baton Rouge with the, the two dominant wins. Um, and, and like I mentioned, it's progress. You know, you want to see progress from year one to year two. Um, you, you got an opportunity now to really cement your, 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 your legacy here. I mean, LSU, I don't think has been to a final four since those, you know, pokey Chapman years and with, with Sylvia Fowles and Simone Augustus and, um, it, it, there, there's there's real opportunity there now um, to to make that happen into a second weekend of the tournament here, um, and you know I think it's 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 a really good opportunity for 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 all those uh, all those players. Dylan, where do you see this? I mean, where, where do, how far can this journey continue? You mentioned, and I'll say this before you go, one of the key things for me was the intensity, the defensive intensity, rebounding, the attention to where, look, LSU knew they were one of the top teams in the country. They knew it. A lot of people knew it, but you still have to play like it. They showed that this weekend, and I think that's kind of one of the turning points. So, Dylan, if they play like that, I mean, how far can this team go in your opinion? Well, a lot of the assumptions about this team and the reason they're a three seed, despite only having two losses, is that the SEC was weak. Um, And so it looks like LSU got a little bit more battle tested throughout the regular season than people expected or gave credit to. Um, And so that that will go into their favor. I mean, at this point, I think I think you've gotten your, your cake and then now anything else is extra. Getting to the Sweet 16 was the goal for this team. Um, And so if they were to lose to Utah, it's not a disappointment by any means. I think that that their biggest game, their biggest obstacle was Michigan. Now anything else is extra for the season uh, ahead of schedule. Uh, They were already ahead of schedule, but this is now like they've made it to the Sweet 16. This is a lot of people's first times, but they're good enough to go further. Um, Utah is going to be an interesting ma- matchup. It's kind of big versus big, star versus star with Angel Reese versus Alyssa Peely. Uh, Alyssa Peely is, uh, I think, around the same height, but uh, is a lot bigger than uh, Angel Reese. So Angel Reese isn't, does, it doesn't seem like she's going to be able to bully Alyssa Peely like she has been able to bully other bigs. Because, um, I mean, if, just from watching a little bit of Utah versus Princeton. Alyssa is a bully in the in the front court and she gets she averaged twenty one points a game, like and she just gets to the she gets to the uh to the rim and if by some reason she misses, it's probably because you had to foul her. So mm-hmm. it, it's gonna be an interesting matchup to watch. But I think that this team is playing with a lot of confidence right now, just the level of defense that they played against a team that a lot of people picked to beat them uh in Michigan. So it, it's going to be interesting to watch. I think that I think that they can go. They could make a final four, and it wouldn't surprise me. But uh, mm-hmm. as I mentioned, I think that right now they've gotten to the point where they needed to this season. Yeah, you don't want to look too far ahead, obviously. But tonight, uh, playing kind of on the other side of this Greenville two regional, it's Indiana Miami will play at eight p.m. and then seven p.m. It's Florida Gulf Coast and Villanova. Now. Let's just say if you went chalk there, it's going to be Indiana-Villanova. The winner of that game, if LSU can beat Utah, would be the opponent next Sunday night, which would be a lot of fun in Greenville as well, with a chance, like you said, Dylan, to go to the Final Four, which that would be amazing, and that would be well ahead of schedule. Uh, so this is the part of the show where we're going to put in an ad break on the audio part, and but we're also – uh, going to see the retention rate drop off dramatically, but I encourage you to stay because my man Glenn West has got some riveting content coming. I think so. I just set Glenn up uh, pretty highly there, put him on a pedestal. Uh, 
Yeah. About the men's basketball program. Look, there's a lot of questions. So we're flipping the page here to the men's basketball program. I've gotten a couple DMs, Glenn. I'm sure you've gotten some comments on social media. Some we've obviously had a lot of conversation on our board as well. The men's season is over. Uh, obviously, we know that. They did. I, I will say this. I was impressed because we haven't talked about it. I was impressed with the effort they showed in the first game against Georgia. I think a lot of people didn't give them a lot of chance, especially you knew they probably had a chance after nearly beating them in Athens during the regular season. They showed a lot of effort. They showed a lot of heart. But the season's over now. We've already seen a couple of uh, different outlets, including 24-7 Sports Report, that they're checking in on numerous guys through the portal. We knew that would be something they had to do. But, Glenn, it's a big question. Where does this team go from here? What does a roster construction look like? I know you've written about this uh, previously already. You can touch on some of those things. But there definitely changes need to be made, and it sounds like changes are going to be coming uh, to Matt McMahon's group. Yeah, there are definitely going to be some changes coming. And, you know, you've got to um, – I think the, the the biggest thing here is I can really split it up into, like, three phases, right? You've got to, you've got to number one, hold on to as many freshmen as you can. Uh, at a Tyrell Ward, Sean Phillips, uh, Jalen Reed, those were three guys that, you know, had, had flashes. You know, it really – had some good moments, but didn't show it consistently throughout the entire season. Um, but those were always going to be guys you were hoping would be around the program for a couple of years. That you'd be able to develop. Um, but when you go through a two and 16 season in SEC play, you know, everything's on the table. So mm -hmm. I think it's going to be really important. And that's why you saw them play a lot down the stretch uh, for Matt McMahon to kind of convince as many of those uh, players as possible to, to return. And um, I, I think, I think there's a chance you could get all three back. Uh, there, there's certainly uh, having some internal conversations, I think, with a lot of their roster right now about which ones they would like to keep, which ones they you know, would encourage to maybe go into the portal and look elsewhere. Um, but I, I think you have to start with the freshmen. You hope that you can get them back. Uh, and then you move on to the, to the more veteran players. Um, and I, I think you have to start with Derek Fountain. Um, he's kind of alluded to it on his social media the last couple of weeks that uh, I think he's going to definitely be back in the fold next year. Um, he's going to be a really important player because really all season long, uh, every every time we asked Matt McMahon about Derek Fountain, it was this is the guy that embodies what we want to be about, what we want to mm -hmm. build our culture and our, our program around um, just in terms of his uh, not, not, not only his play and his you know aggression, his physicality and his heart, but just, you know, his, uh, his leadership off the court too, really kind of stepped up, um, you know, when LSU was going through some really tough times this year. So, uh, you can get fountain back. That would be great. Um, I am a big believer still in Adam Miller. I think that, uh, look first year off of a serious knee injury, um, never really got going from, from beyond the arc. That was definitely something that was noticeable. He, shot I think 30 percent from three-point range on pretty high volume which is um, not very efficient and 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 certainly needs to get back in the gym and, and, and make some offseason improvements but um, I like the, the player and and you saw flashes especially down the stretch of him not settling for threes attacking the rim um, kicking it out to teammates um, I think there's a lot of untapped potential there when he's not the guy you know like the number one or number two option offensively, he can be a complimentary piece for you to win uh, a lot of games next year if, if you can find the right people around him. And uh, I think that's that those those two are the ones that I would really push hard for if I'm McMahon to get coming back. Um, you know, we've we've there's there's a number of guys that I I don't know that they're going to be back. I mean, you can kind of run down the line here. Justice Hill, not sure if he'll be back. Justice Williams is a candidate to probably hit the portal. Um, and Wani Wilkinson, look, Will Wade just got hired by McNeese State, and, and Wani played for Will his first two years in LSU. That makes a ton of sense. He's coming off a really serious injury, a uh, chance to go play at a you know mid-major school that – uh, where he'll be able to have probably more of an offensive load and opportunity there, that would be um, you know, make a lot of sense for him. Um, and, and, and then the, there are the you know the Trey Hannibals of the world that I th I could see LSU making a play to come back, but just um, you know, not entirely sure about him or a guy like Cam Hayes. Um, but uh, yeah, those those are kind of the pool of players here that you're looking at to hopefully get back into the program. Um, and then you kind of hit 
the transfer portal and 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 I think the transfer portal is going to be huge. The one thing that you can't do if you're LSU um, is run it back with most of the same core. Mm. I mean, you, you've got to make some improvements via the portal. Um, I think you know, like I said, they're having conversations with players. You know, they're back from spring break right now. I think they're um, they've got a plan in place. Um, there's certainly some some portal guys out there that they've talked to, which we can get into in a little bit. But um, yeah, the, there's there's no doubt that you've got to see some significant changes roster management wise, roster construction wise, uh, and hope that those are the right changes that you need uh, heading into a really crucial off season here in year two. And you talked about some of those conversations. They're obviously going to be tough ones, but I think they're obviously conversations that have to take place to move forward with this roster. And the two things I like that you said that you pointed out was about Derek Fountain. I don't think that it was a lip service from the mouth of Matt McMahon about Fountain's what we want. We saw when, one, when he obviously he was healthy, he got injured down the stretch. But it was healthy how active he was, how he embodied kind of what this team wanted. Folks, that's really important for next year to have a guy that you can key in on especially with KJ Williams gone especially with all the names that you mentioned to be able to bring in transfers and say okay this guy's been here in year one under Matt McMahon and he kind of knows what the expectation is and he can move forward by being whether it's maybe not in a statistical category but he's a leader in the sense of he knows how to lead this team until those other guys get comfortable uh, Dylan before we kind of wrap it up I want to I want to point this to you because this has kind of been uh, the questions I've gotten on social media, and a lot of us have, is what what would make you feel comfortable at the end of the summer, maybe getting into the new school year, not for you because you'll graduate, congratulations, but the new school year where you say, you know what, I, I feel comfortable with where this roster is. It is a number of transfers. Is it, we? I mean, maybe not a specific name, obviously we don't know yet, but what makes you feel comfortable rolling into next season? Is it a, you know identifying a guy in the portal that says, hey, this is a lead guard that can help lead this team? I felt like guard play could have been really uh, better this season. That was one thing for me. Where do you kind of stand? What makes you feel better rolling into next season? The fact that this year's over, maybe? Um, yeah, like it just a new team. I don't know. Um, I, like Y'all have kind of hit the nail on the head. A new core, a new guard, like new guard play – Absolutely. They need a lead guard, like an actual point guard. And I think that's something that Mac, Matt McMahon teams in the past have had, and they just didn't this year. Um, obviously, you know, you look back, John ja Morant, but not he doesn't need, we don't, don't need a John ja Morant. Someone who can, you know, effectively run an offense and actually, you know, get the game going. Uh, and I think that's really just what a lot of, I think LSU missed a lot of, of the glue to hold the team together this year. Um, and it was kind of just, you know, loose, uncoordinated basketball play is what it felt like for a lot of it. So getting someone who can um, actually, you know, on the court be a coach would be a huge addition. And I think it's probably going to be, you know, a veteran transfer who's yeah. looking for a, a, a new, a new shot. Um yeah, I, I I don't know. I, there's not a, there's not a lot that'll make me going going to next year feeling like oh yeah this is the year, Elijah's <laughs> back. No. But no. Uh, just feeling like I just want to get to a point where I'm not dreading watching LSU basketball. Because that's where we were at some point. I was like, oh, I do not want to watch this. About <laughs> like, mid-February. About mid-February, yeah. like, oh, oh, here we go. You know, this is what's happening. Glenn, you were about to say something like there. It was like mid-January for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mid-February. Uh, yeah, well, look, just bouncing off of that a little bit from what Dylan was saying, you've got to get a, 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 a ball handler, a point guard that can mm. get shots for, open guy, for, for other guys. I mean, they just didn't have any of that this year. You could tell it was really tough on KJ Williams. Um, you know, teams were double teaming him, and he was still getting his shots, still getting his points. But the the offense was just clunky and just not uh, didn't move well at all. And I think uh, getting a, a point guard in here that can move the ball, um, set guys up, attack, um, get to the rim, um, that's going to be priority number one for me. Uh, you've got to add size. Um, at every position. I mean, LSU was undersized practically at every position last year. Um, they were running out, you know, Cam Hayes, Justice Hill, Adam Miller, you know, three guard sets for a while. Um, 
you know, Derek Fountain's a great player. He's six foot seven, six foot eight. You can't ask him to go up against seven footers in the SEC and expect to not, you know, kind of get. Uh, I don't, I don't want to say pushed around, but definitely, you know, the, the the improvement needs to come there in terms of just adding size, getting a rim protector in there. I think Sean Phillips, if you can get him back, develop him this off season, he makes a ton of sense as a potential guy that can. Uh, have an increased um, role on this team next year. Um, so that's certainly something. Uh, and then just I, I wanted to hit on a couple of the transfer guys that they've kind of reached out to already, um, guys that we've seen and heard. Um, they've, they've set up meetings with uh, Nick Tim- Nick Timberlake is a guard out of Towson. Uh, they had, a, uh, I believe, a Zoom call meeting with him uh, either early this week or late last week. And so he's a guy that you certainly want to keep an eye on. Um, Amari Abram is a, is a guard out of Ole Miss. Um, he, he just recently uh, picked up some interest from LSU last week when he entered the portal. Um, uh, Javon, Javon Small is a guard from uh, East ECU. He's a guy that uh, I know LSU's reached out to. They've had a couple of in-home visits with guys. Um, mm-hmm. But these are, these are all players that are in the 6'2", 6'3", 6'4", range uh, of kind of guards that I think that are a little bit bigger um, guys that can score, um, and, and I think can really help LSU out next year as a, as a, as a guard um, in, in that respect. And so, uh, BJ Mack is another one f- a forward out of Wofford. Uh, he's somebody that LSU's reached out to, as well as Jaden Taylor, who's another forward out of Butler. Um, so, those are just a couple of the names that we've heard so far. Um, I think LSU certainly needs to to make a jump. I think you're going to start hearing some stuff later this week. Um, about guys maybe entering the portal on LSU side and then maybe making some some jumps and some moves on some guys in the portal. Um, they've got to start moving. They got to start moving here. And I think as you know, as teams start to kind of fall out of the NCAA tournament picture as well, you'll see even more players enter the portal and more guys uh, that LSU reaches out to. So um, you've got to you've got to rebuild this thing. And I, I think you've you've you 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 hope that you can get some of the freshmen back. I think you hope that you can get. Fountain and, and and Miller potentially back. That would be a really sc- a good start to the off season. Um, but after that, I think everything is on the table, and I think you've really got to go after a, a, a lot of different guys, a lot of big pieces uh, that you need to fill around that 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 five man uh, group that you hope to return. So um, that that's kind of my spiel here on basketball, where things are at. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll. We'll certainly see here, I think, as the week progresses, some some movement on, on the men's basketball side. Yeah, and look, you know, um, not even going to ask anybody how their brackets are going. We're just going to end that right no. there because mine's in shambles. But I did want to mention this. <laughs> I did want to mention ahead this. for mine. Uh, before I joined you all, guys, I, I know we put it on the board and I've put it out there a little bit. I did broadcast some some games. Got the chance to see the kid from ECU in person and the kid from Wofford. Uh, both would be welcome additions, uh, not just because LSU needs some players, but I think they would also kind of fit the mold of what McMahon wants. Also, Nicholas Timberlake, six foot four. 205 yeah. pounds, 210. That's the kind of guard, that's a body that can play in the SEC. Uh, and the definition of a floor general would be a graduate transfer. And look, so the one much. and look, the one thing that I did want to mention here also, I mean, I, uh, we've had a lot of discussion on our board about McMahon and about um, just the, the slow start out of the gate. Uh, I'm not sure if people realize, but they, there are some pretty heavy recruiting restrictions going on right now within that program that were self-imposed. Um, I know mm-hmm. the self-imposed penalties people can kind of gloss over sometimes and say, oh, how how strictly are they going to you know enact that? They haven't been able to get on the road as much. Um, you know, I'm not trying to be here and say that this is the Matt McMahon savior or anything like this, but there are some there are some recruiting restrictions, some visit restrictions that they have. Uh, in terms of bringing players in um, that were self-imposed by LSU because of everything that went down uh, the last couple of years. Uh, and then you still don't even have the NCAA investigation wrapped up yet. I think uh, I wrote about this earlier in the week, but that should be starting to come to a close here before the summer. I would imagine we learned something about LSU uh, and their penalties before the summer. But, um, you know, look, McMahon, yes, it was probably a swing and a miss in year one in terms of the players that he was that he brought in. Um, but I think he deserves, you know, a couple more shots at this. You know, I don't mm-hmm. think there's any uh, 
you know, they gave him a seven year contract for a reason. And I think part of that reason was because they realized how difficult it was going to be uh, for him to recruit in the first couple of years here. So, um, you know, I think you, you know, you, you take the good with the bad, but there's certainly some uh, extenuating circumstances here that have kind of led to uh, a really poor start. And and certainly I think as you know, those recruiting restrictions start to get lifted, you start to learn about the penalties coming out. Um, they'll, they'll have a much clearer picture on how they can operate this program moving forward. Yeah, it'll be interesting to watch and monitor. And obviously, uh, it's going to be a busy, busy thing with everything going on as well. This has been the Go 24-7 podcast. I want to thank Dylan Sanders and Glenn West for making the time here on Monday to talk to you. If you have not already, make sure you subscribe to the channel. We're doing great on the numbers, continuing to grow that. And we're only going to have more content with spring football starting back uh, after spring break. Obviously, baseball season uh, getting in full. And then, like you just heard, portal talk for hoops. And also, don't forget that portal opening Uh, for football, which I guarantee you a lot of LSU fans have their fingers crossed uh, hoping nobody falls in, especially a a quarterback that some people still are scared and nervous that he might jump in. uh, That I don't think he will. I don't think think so either, but you know, it's going to be a good conversation (laughs) to talk about it nonetheless. We thank you so much for tuning in, whether it's on audio, make sure to follow us, follow us on Spotify, Apple podcasts, wherever you get those. And if you're on YouTube, once again, cannot tell you enough, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button completely free. It just helps us continue to grow to the channel. We'll catch you next time here on the go 24 seven podcast.